Howdy. This week, I interview Remy Wilkins, who is an author from Cannonball Books. He just released an audiobook for his book, Strays, that I can't recommend enough, and that can be found in the show notes. Last thing, Cannon Press's annual fall sale begins next week, October 7th, and moves through the 11th. 30% off almost everything in the store. Do not miss this opportunity to snag those books you've been meaning to get. Without further ado, meet Remy Wilkins. Remy Wilkins, author of Strays. You have sci-fi fiction out in the world under a different yes, name. Sir. Yes, sir. You're a school teacher. I'm not sure if you wrote this, but on your bio, it says Remy Wilkins was born on one side of the Mississippi River and lives on the other. He teaches at Geneva Academy in Monroe, Louisiana, and he writes at home where his wife paints and his five boys raise a ruckus. That is correct. I did write that. Were you born in Louisiana? I was born in Mississippi. Okay. I was born on that side, more eastern. Uh, my parents were both from Alabama, so they steadily moved westward. I moved uh, to Louisiana with them when I was 12. Okay. And... So that's my biography. <laughs> okay, and then where'd you go to college? I went to two places. I went to... Uh, the Northeast Louisiana University, which is now University of Louisiana at Monroe, but okay. I've never attended under that name, and I attended at uh, New St. Andrews. Okay. Did you ever go to any any uh, UL Monroe football games? Uh, yeah, I went to a couple, and I even went to one in Idaho when they played the Vandals one year. That's hilarious. We, uh, yeah. I, as a University of Texas fan, we play. I think we do UL Monroe every year. Um, so, you know, hook them. And, okay, and then you went to NSA. <laughs> yes, you, sir. Did you split those years at all, or did you did you do extra college? Were you, did you do extra school? I did. Well, when uh, I first was ready to find a college, uh, my dad suggested this school in Idaho. Uh, at the time, I believe it had 12 students. Right. And I said, I don't know if that's really for me. I went to uh, NLU for a couple of years and uh, did not enjoy it. I had uh, a couple of bad experiences. Well, not bad as in just uh, did not encounter the sort of uh, uh, love of learning that I was hoping to find there. I started out as a history major and being a good a uh, student went to go speak to the dean of history. And the first thing he said to me was, I don't know why you want to be a history major. I have the best job you can get, and I hate it. So I immediately <laughs> yeah, I immediately changed to English after that. Um, and then, you know, I had a class where it was me and six other students in this huge classroom and I could not understand why they gave us this massive classroom until a test rolled around and it was packed, you know, 50 people in this this room that were all skipping the class and uh, just just hoping to skate through guessing, I guess. So I did not enjoy my time there. So after that, I think uh, NSA was up to uh, the mid 30s, maybe 40s. And I thought, oh, sounds great. I'll, I'll try that. I mean, yeah, after all, you're only a class with like six people. That's probably going to be the size of your class if you came to the NSA. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> I, was, I was already accustomed to that sort of uh, teacher, students. Okay. And then so you, you did four years at NSA, I assume, after that? I mean, I did, I did four years. I lived there five so that I could get married to one of the local ladies. <laughs> she did not uh, attend NSA. She was at the University of Idaho, but we had mutual friends. So. And you've had five kids since. You guys moved back to Louisiana. That's correct. I was working at a coffee shop uh, in Pullman, Washington, when uh, when I was contacted by the school down here to uh, teach. And so we moved, uh, 
think that was 17 years ago or 16 years ago, somewhere in there. So I've I've been here ever since. What what coffee shop was it, if I might ask? Cafe Moro. That's wow. mine. Wow, nice. Very cool. It's a very nice. Yeah, the uh, the it was an ER doctor that uh, funded it, and he hired me to to set it up and get it going. And it was a tax write off, so he spent way too much on the building and design and all the rest. And and I said, you're never going to get money back. And <laughs> he said, that's ah, fine. It's just a cool place for me, and government was going to take it all anyway. So it was kind of a no pressure. Um, business venture for me uh, and you know it was, it was a lot of fun and learned a lot and realized I don't want to work retail yeah I can imagine so that you know that's but that's actually fascinating it's a little plum in history for uh, you know anybody that comes into town and goes to a Cafe Mora that's right he sold it after I left and uh, okay. so nobody I know works there anymore was Bruce Books there at the time Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. That's awesome. You can still to this day go there and pick up uh, New San Andrews books on the cheap. <laughs> yeah, that is a great, great bookstore. Yeah, I'd go there every weekend if I could. I, yeah, I think I uh, just uh, just this week I opened up a book and and saw the uh, the Bruce book pencil price right. right in there. So yep, yep. That's still cool. encountering the fruits of those uh, those time, the time spent there. <laughs> Okay, and so you teach at Geneva, is it Geneva Classical Academy? That's Geneva Academy. Just the Geneva Name Academy. The, okay. Just Geneva Academy. What are you teaching there? I teach in the upper school, so I'll leap around from uh, grade 7 and up. Uh, I've, I've, over the last few years, been more restricted to a few classes. To uh, I do the languages, uh, Latin and Greek. I've got a. Uh, I did manage to hang on to the astronomy class, which is one of my pet passions. Uh, and I've, I teach uh, um, history and, and literature. So we've we've divided up the the course into three years uh, that we cycle through um, twice. So it's ancient, medieval, and modern. So I've over the years have taught all of those. Um, and I have a thesis class where we we uh, work on some a large writing project in their senior years. And there's a few other electives that cycle in and out. But uh, that's, that's mostly what I do So you, uh, you each year. Is the, you mentioned uh, your favorite, though, is the astronomy. Favorite, but it is one that, that I, uh, that I uh, enjoy teaching. But not, uh, that, that's but, not, but not your favorite. I'm not, what I mean is I was not trained as an astronomer. I took a class in college. Uh, that's not, that's not my specialty necessarily, uh, but I I uh, enjoy it enough that I've uh, requested that I keep that one. Oh, nice. So they've stripped me of of geology, and uh, which I did enjoy, but they they got you got you got to have the the other guy uh, do things as well. And so biology wasn't my favorite. I liked the subject, didn't like the the touching of dead things. <laughs> um, so, so we, you know, we had to hand some of these things off, but I was able to to hold on to astronomy. Yeah, those whose sensibilities are more prone to, you know, the touching of dead things. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it was beneficial. We had a doctor and uh, uh, one of the students. Um, his father was a doctor, and so I was able to get him to do come in and do some uh, dissections for us, which was great. Uh, they learned lots more than. You know, me trying not to uh, touch things with my bare hand, and and so we, I was able to avoid the that sort of thing. But necessary part of biology class, I recognize. <laughs> so I do want to talk about astrology, but what is you know, if that isn't your favorite, what is your favorite? Oh man, well, I, I, uh, I, literature is is uh, has always been one of. Uh, one of my uh, passions, so I, I guess I would stick with that one since it's the more the most long running of of, uh, of what I've uh, pursued in in my learning. So uh, poetry, uh, fiction, those those two have been lifelong. Uh, astronomy was a a late comer to uh, my uh, my interest. Yeah. So can I ask? So what what authors are you guys 
do you guys roll through with uh, both poetry and and fiction? Uh, well, I mean, in 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 our regular omnibus class, we we encounter uh, Dante, Chaucer, uh, Shakespeare, obviously those guys, uh, John Milton. Um, I, I I can go for for days just hanging out with them and and enjoying uh, their work. Uh, I do a poetry elective uh, that that comes through uh, periodically in the, in uh, you know, once once every four years I think it is, uh, and I, I I it's mostly me uh, hitting the highlights and then plucking some personal favorites uh, from my shelf and bringing those in and then getting to play around with words uh, with the students and that's always fun. I, I went to a public school. If I think back to like my junior year when we really hit what was like high literature, um, I think we I remember reading The Great Gatsby, and then I remember mm -hmm. us as the class um, sort of mutinying, mutinying is that right? Mutinying um, about Shakespeare because we were going to read Macbeth, but we said there's no way we can be tested on this. Uh, we don't know how to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so we got out of that. So uh, that's really all I remember of my of my high school lit. I picked up an on, omnibus the other day somewhere deep in the canyons of Canon and uh was really blown away by like what the students cover like their 7th grade year. Yeah, I was I I I was homeschooled and uh while I encountered a lot of uh uh of the 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 canon I think uh, there were still some some broad gaps that um, I, I'm steadily filling in. Uh, Gatsby was one I had not read. I had to pick that one up my own um, year, uh, years ago, as as uh, as when I first started teaching modern on with this. And uh, To Kill a Mockingbird was another one that I didn't read as a kid. Which you know that's one of those where I felt like oh boy I would have really enjoyed this. Um, I wish I could have encountered it as uh, younger, but um, yeah, I, I'm 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 still filling in my own education as well. I think it was the seventh grade year, and I was just like, "Wow, I think this looked like my first year of college." So right now, one of the reasons I uh, I pestered you about this is because I'm editing your audiobook for the book Strays. Yes, I'm super enjoying it, and I'm also I feel bad. Uh, we put you. I think you came up here. Last summer, that's correct. For like a, locked me in the dark room. Yeah, for a fam yeah, just a family vacation. You're just trying to enjoy yourself, and we said, I hope you can spare like two hours a day, uh, every day, for you to read Strays. Yes, <laughs> I was. I was. I was. I was advised. I was thinking I could come in, you know, read for uh, read for a couple hours, take a break, and then maybe do another two hour shift and uh and brian told me that was not advisable he said two <laughs> two hours is about the max and turned out that was very wise by that sixth day i was uh pretty fried as i hope you can't tell all that much but you probably could tell i was ready to be done oh, with the yeah. dark room it's uh you know anymore i tell people they're not allowed to go over like 45 minutes it's yeah. it's a it's a tough thing. It's I think it's a lot harder than I just originally thought it would be. I thought it would be kind of just a breeze, you know. Yeah, it it, it is strangely draining. When I was in college, I worked at a uh, call center. We did surveys, and I felt terrible because at the end of the the shift, which I think we had an eight hour shift, or maybe it was five. The the max I worked, I don't remember now. But at the end of it, I was exhausted. And I would be upset because I just sat around in a chair and made phone calls all day. And it just felt silly to be tired after that. But it, there's something draining about sitting and talking, uh, especially if there's no interaction. It's just me and my book. Yeah, no interaction. Uh, and it's and it's slightly performative, you know, so you're making an effort. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're striving for a particular cadence. Um. But I mean, you. So you have five boys. That's right. I. I mean, I imagine you've done your time in reading out loud to them. Um, oh yeah. Was uh was there any? Yeah, I, 
any overlap there or was this far more draining? Uh, well, I, it's, I, I, I did not read in two hour chunks. Uh, <laughs> usually with the boys, uh, we would read right before bed. And so I would go around 40 minutes. Um, but, uh, I, that's, that's, uh, uh, that, yeah, that, that's about as far as I would go. I, usually at that point, one of the younger ones has dropped off to sleep and, um, that's that's the privilege of the younger child. He gets to sleep through part of the book, uh, <laughs> but I still didn't want to churn through multiple chapters while he was while he was out. So um, I, I usually restricted it to uh, thirty forty minutes. Also, I was tired. It's at the end of the day, and if I'm teaching. I'd been talking all day, so I didn't want to be growling. You know, my have to take care take care of the money makers. You know. So, that's right. That's uh, right. <laughs> so one thing I love, I think that comes through a lot on this side of it, listening to you read it rather than reading it, it's got this, it captures that perfect Southern sort of Americana aspect to it that, uh, I mean, I think if folks know you, that comes through probably on the page, but it yeah. already is so Americana. I mean, you have, I mean, baseball's at the heartbeat of of the book, which is, of course, but your southern drawl is is like sends it <laughs> makes it a lot more enjoyable. Oh, good. Well, that's uh, I was I was I had to be talked into doing the the audio book. Uh, I'm of course imagining some uh, resplendent British voice uh, <laughs> doing the, doing it all, but uh, but I, it, I I do feel like that does need a, a southern voice. So I I, I hope it. Uh, turns out well it's so good I, yeah. i'm not an actor i'm the only <laughs> uh, you know my i have uh several uh, brothers and a sister and they were all involved in the local theater i'm i'm the secret wilkins uh i occasionally i'll meet people and they'll recognize me as you know related to someone they did plays with and and they would say oh you're the secret wilkins you know the one that doesn't do anything and i'm like that's right i don't i i, I don't go to the stage it was a new thing yeah well, like I said, it has been uh it's been a blast. Um so oh, good. Strays with the first on our Cannonball fiction imprint. It's one of those jarring covers. It's always uh yeah. at least peered at by the homeschool moms on our on our little conference runs. Um <laughs> do you could tell us tell us about Strays. Yeah, well, the way I pitched it early on, um again being bad at selling stories I, I pitched it as my lutheran adventure story uh <laughs> which is a terrible way and i eventually stopped but the the two the two main sources of inspiration were uh c.s lewis's screw tape letters uh, on one side and martin luther's uh, somewhat comedic encounters with uh, the devil that he records in his writing and uh, putting those two worlds together um, was uh, was was at the the, the core of uh, this little uh, this little fairy tale that I told. I, the the first iteration was just a little story. I, before I read to my boys, I would tell them uh, little silly stories, uh, most of the time made up on the fly. Uh, a few of them I I put some forethought in. So it stray started off as a little fairy tale called the, the the little lost demon and it was just about a ungrateful grouchy uh demon who didn't like anything uh and he learned to like various things um sunshine and baseball and and uh just a little story to show how funny it is to you know laugh, laugh at someone who didn't have any gratitude for life and and then demonstrate uh, a joy for uh, the, the things of the world uh, right before my boys went to bed. So I, that's what it started off as. Uh, and then as I uh, considered writing it down and fleshing it out, uh, began drawing in uh, more of these these uh, influences. Yeah. Uh, so do you mind telling us about Pinwheel? Yeah, he was the the, the little lost demon. Um, the, uh, the the one of the reasons I love Forrest's uh, cover so much is uh, he is a fan of uh, the the animator who is known for 
um, uh, he was one of the classic uh, Disney uh, animators. Uh, he did uh, Sword in the Stone and uh, The Great Mouse Detective, one of the okay. main animators for that. Uh, well, in The Great Mouse Detective, there's this little bat creature. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the no. cartoon, but there's this little bat creature. Uh, he's a uh, he's one of the henchmen to uh, Ratigan, the uh, the evil rat. So uh, I, I I somewhat had that was my my first little uh, visual clue, my little totem that I had as a writer, uh, imagining uh, Pinwheel, um, and because it, it you know as a writer as I've already explored the characters and and where they were going and who they were. I knew Pinwheel was going to be uh, become one of the heroes of the book, but I had to start off in a in a in a uh, more nefarious place for him. So I needed something a little uh, a little darker to to keep me from doing something too cute and cuddly and <laughs> and lovable. Right. So, we uh, kept so that him. that was my little little picture for myself. You mentioned the forest cover. So did you tell Forrest like that was kind of what you were thinking? No, actually he came up with that on his own and, and I said something, Oh wow, it reminds me of this one animator and uh and I think that was passed on to him and and I was informed that that was one of his major influences. So uh, okay. it was uh I was very pleased that that we we uh jived at that level. Yeah, Forrest is uh, you know, I will never I'll never tell him, but uh yeah, he's he's pretty good at the drawing <laughs> stuff. And uh we can't talk hey, about him anymore. Okay. We, we have to keep it to a low minimum <laughs> Forrest compliment level on the podcast. Um right. but, well, I'm glad uh I'm glad writers outrank uh the uh the RP. Uh, nice. <laughs> now you worked on that for I if I remember correctly, I was told that it was, you know, that was something you had been working on for a long time before we had a manuscript of it. Is that true? Yeah, the, uh, I I think the writing portion of it, I mean, it, it had been something that I had been mulling over. Uh, what, what happened was, teacher and um, not having a, a job over the summers, uh, I would go up to my father-in-law's uh, place and he, where he is a farmer, and I would do the farm boy thing. Uh, over the summer months, and we would stay out at their house, and it was a, a great time for for us to be up in Idaho and see old friends that are still up there, and and uh, we earn a little bit between uh, the school year. But uh, after seven years, so I like to joke that after I paid off uh, paid him off for uh, for the wife I got, sure, uh, he he went and hired skilled labor, <laughs> so. Uh, I, I was uh, I was uh, offered a chance to continue on and be the guy that hands uh, you know him the the wrench while he fixes things and but I, I declined uh, uh, so that I could focus on this book so so it started off just as a way of uh, of keeping some dignity as I was fired from my father no I'm just kidding I wasn't <laughs> fired by my father-in-law but uh, but but it was a way of uh, filling my my time so that it, my wife didn't kick me out and make me look for another job sure. so uh i think i wrote uh the the first summer i wrote uh, a good chunk maybe maybe not quite half uh and uh realized there were some story points that i did not consider and it was it was uh kind of a mess uh so i i broke it the the first the first time the first run at it did not work. I fixed it over the Christmas holiday, and then the next summer I uh, went through it and uh, and finished uh, finished the first rewrite. I think uh, I think by the time it came out, I had gone through it uh, seven times, uh, and and then reading through it last year, I realized it, it needs needs a couple more. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, it, and again, that's that's mostly work in the summer. I, I had a hard time uh, writing during the school year. I've, I've labored at getting better at that. So, uh, so I so I'm not just writing 
two months every year trying to be more uh, efficient about uh, and keeping my my toes in some writing project all year long now but uh, so that that was that was the the first run through i i did read it to my children uh aloud to them uh the problem was is they're impatient when i would pause to uh to to jot notes to myself uh <laughs> and and they start yelling every single time i pause to to just draw a line under a sentence that i didn't like so Too i did funny. read it aloud i should have i should have read it more carefully um uh, to myself or or to my wife who would not be impatient with me as i uh <laughs> i got to imagine though, those guys are awesome few, those would be awesome to get you yeah. to finish a book though you know i got to imagine that that has its own value yeah that was i i, I part of me wishes i had uh, not waited so long in the process to to read it to them i wish i had i wish i had you know finished the first draft and then just sat down and and uh and read it to them that would have been beneficial to to get that right off the bat because you know adults don't want to hurt your feelings and say boy this part was really boring <laughs> although you guys did do that to me in a couple places but uh which I'm thankful for. Brian Cole is, uh, but, is a savage. But, uh, luckily, I just get to market oh, yeah. it and tell everybody else how good it is. So me and you, I feel like we've always been on the same <laughs> same page. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I don't <laughs> have anything against you, but Brian is. Uh, got, I owe him a few. No. I have to imagine too, as a fan, you, you being a fan of poetry that I know you are. Um, has it influenced your next books? Because I I know that you have a book on deck. Uh, ready to go with Cannonball again, called Hush Hush. Yeah, has that uh has that experience influenced this manuscript? Uh, oh yeah, I I think uh, the uh, attentiveness to words and symbols, uh, the, the writing the sort of stories that I've wanted to see written, uh, which is I think one of the main reasons writers get into uh, the 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 writing world is. Um, that all that comes from me reading poetry and enjoying the the depth and richness uh, and layers that a poem can have. But when we get to, um, well, I don't want to castigate all children's literature, but you know, there, there's a lot oh, that's out there. It's just yeah. simple and thin, and and it doesn't have the the weight that again I think kids can handle a lot more than uh, what is so often offered to them. So part of part of why I wanted to write these stories is uh, is to to be able to inject some of that uh, that richness that I've uh, pulled off from from other writers and and poets that I've enjoyed and wanting to in- inject that into a a fun little in- adventure story. Yes, I will say I uh the first time I read Strays, I was um thoroughly indicted on not knowing um any of my astrology. Um and but having but you offered me at least the guilt of being like, well, I would like to. Um Well, and... well let, let me guilt you a little bit further real quick. Uh there's no problem with not knowing anything about astrology, which is a bunk um, Uh-oh. Uh, view of the, the stars guiding our life. Uh, that that's uh, that's garbage. So you don't need to know anything about that. But astronomy, that. Oh, you know, rookie move. <laughs> sorry, rookie sorry. move. No, sorry. Yeah. no, I need that. I need that. You know, I got proud. No, it, I got proud early. I appreciate this. <laughs> well, it it. it it's still the last year I I taught it. I did talking with a parent even say astrology to them, and their eyes got really big. Right. So it it happens occasionally. So the but. distinction would be like if it's if it's something I can find in a magazine, and it's dictating to me the rest of my month, then it's astrology and it's bunk. That's that's yeah that's yeah and it's going off Babylonian. Uh, uh, set up so it's all out of date now the stars have shifted you know 2000 years later so oh wow uh, it's 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 not only bunk but it's an accurate bunk so I mean, you're saying not, i'm not actually we're not even Scorp- under the 
Go ahead. Potentially, they're not even Scorpio. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I've been lied Sorry, to my man. whole life. So tell, okay, so fill in the other half for me. Astronomy is therefore. Well, so in the ancient world, uh, you would be aware of where you are in the year because of uh, keeping note of the stars. So the, the constellations are the, the band of stars that we see over for the course of the year. So in, in Genesis, uh, you know, God creates the, the, the great light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Well, each of those three um, lights uh, measure uh, is one of our time measurements. So the sun obviously governs the day. The moon get, get, uh, governs the month or determines the month. And the stars are the year. Now, we think, because we're moderns, uh, a year is when the Earth has traveled um, uh, around the sun. But in the ancient world, uh, again, the, the view being that the Earth was at the cosmological center, uh, the uh, year would be measured by the stars. So they would keep track as the Earth progressed um, around the this uh, or this band of stars, rather progressed around the Earth. Right. So, so part of knowing astronomy is just knowing where you are in the world. Because you're saying, you know, Jesus didn't have like one of those large three foot by two foot calendars that he sort of kept track of. Right. Right. Like hanging. In and his you room. know, even. Even with these phones in our pocket, you, if you download a, a, a map, a, one of the star maps, uh, so many of them are inaccurate. Uh, I mean, they might be accurate in the sense of this is what you would get from a book, but it's not accurate in the sense of this is what you will see, you know, standing in your front yard looking up at you know, 11 p.m. Really? 2 a.m. Because, yeah. So... Well, I mean, it's just giving you one one picture. Sure. So it changes every night. Right. Okay. So do you? Is there an app like how, so? Um, hopefully, whether everybody that's listening goes go goes and gets strays, or they're hearing you now, they're thoroughly guilted into not knowing their astronomy. What what would, how would you uh what would you tell us to go and do? Do it like an app would have well, been my first can... thought. Yeah, the, the the app will be fine in the sense that it'll tell you uh, generally what what constellation will be in the skies at the time you're living. Uh, and usually, it's just this is what it is for the northern hemisphere. Now, it'll look different depending on where you are uh, in the northern hemisphere. And over the course of night, again, because of the rotation of the Earth. It, the band of stars will move across the night sky. Uh, what your apps frequently will do is just throw up uh, w one little picture, or at least they'll identify one little uh, spot saying, okay, on August 31st, these are the stars that'll be in the sky. And at some point on August 31st, that, that picture is probably accurate. But okay. again, you, if you get out there too early, you know that constellation might not be in the center of the sky, or or you might have missed it as as it's already rotated out. But those are helpful to to get the uh, lay of the land, the, yeah, the, the progress of the constellations. Uh, there's there's pictures of these things, so you can uh, learn to identify them uh, and uh, keep keep up with them over the course of of uh, of the year. I mean, it's hard because it's Light pollution is so prominent; it's hard to find oh, that's true. a dark enough area to where you can really go out and appreciate uh, these things. Okay. So it, it, it's a hard thing sure. um, to to uh, find. And, uh, there's all sorts of other fun things you can get out of this. Yeah. So if we have our app, is there anything else you would encourage? Like, what would be the best way if if we wanted to kind of maybe go down the rabbit hole of of astronomy? Mm -hmm. Like a Christian, of course. Yes, yes. Well, uh, um, you know, the the interesting thing 
about astronomy is that if you once you start looking up in the night sky and there are you know these seven stars that form this constellation you know so say it's uh, leo so you're looking up at leo it looks nothing like a lion you you're there's just a few stars chosen out of this you know massive sprinkling of stars right so the curious thing is if you go to other cultures they all selected these same stars so there's a unity in ancient astronomy from all these separate peoples uh, recognizing that this is one of the constellations this is one of the signs which is a, which is something that you know we, we we find it's difficult to explain why did they choose these same stars if it's really just they looked up there and they started making some cute pictures right um, I mean I think there's something there, I think it the the constellation uh, is uh, I mean there there's several constellations mentioned in the Bible uh, I think that uh, well certainly God didn't have a random you know he's just throwing them out there and he doesn't care how the stars fall out I certainly think there's a structure to them uh, the the constellations are uniform uh, such that it, it would be curious. Uh, if uh, if there was no basis, if there was nothing more significant than, hey, this looks like a, a lion, which right. is it doesn't. It, it's it, you know, finding snakes in the sky. Oh yeah, that's easy. We could we could all find a <laughs> bunch of snakes up there. Right. But there's some fairly complex uh, symbols going on up there. So I just think that's fascinating. Uh, which is, you know, Strays became one of these books where as I was building, you know, fleshing it out from this little simple fairy tale, I just started pouring stuff that I like. I like baseball. So I wanted my character to, to swing a baseball bat. I thought that was fun. And then the, the Zodiac, I just think it's neat. And so I, and it, and it's a little scary to people. So I needed my, uh, you know, the uncle Ray to be a little scary, a little off putting, you know, he's got longer hair. He wears tie dye. Uh, that that makes him a little iffy in my in my mind. He he's got all these strange carvings all over his weird house. So uh, so I you know it's just whatever I like. I just started throwing it in there. A tie dye bathroom. I like Luther. This yeah. is a tie dye bathroom. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I don't I don't, I don't have a particular affinity for tie dye, but I do think it's funny that Ray loves the tie dye. So yeah, it's it's phenomenal, uh, phenomenal. You were you were moving on and then I and I interrupted you rudely. Uh, you were going on to Luther. You like Luther. Well, Luther's uh, these these stories that that Luther, uh, which which uh, I think some uh, of them are uh, apocryphal, uh, but still the these stories that were were uh, passed on about uh, uh, Satan tempting him while he's uh, he's trying to translate the the, the Bible into German. Um, you know, and he and and in his writings he'll say things like, "If the devil devil ever uh, tempts you, just just fart in his face." Uh, I, those sort of things tickled me. Uh, that's not the view of of Satan that that we tend to have. Uh, but he was so jocular. But on the other hand, he had a high view of uh, of their danger. So it wasn't like um, he's saying, "Oh, we don't need to worry about this." It's it's no big deal. He 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 saw the world filled with devils. That's that's one of the lines from A Mighty Fortress. Right. Which uh, uh but it was not good. Hello. Oh, there you are. You there? Uh, yes, sir. We are struggling with the Louisiana airwaves or the Idaho airwaves, which, you know, who's to say who's better? Um no, I, I'm pretty sure it's Louisiana. If, if there's a technological, <laughs> although Idaho may be one of the states we can we can outrank technologically. So I don't know. I was we'll, going to we'll, say, we'll, you know, we'll, Idaho's it's it's you know up here. It's it's uh, it's it it blows. It still blows me away sometimes. There's really no like major highway to somewhere. You know. Yes, you're a Texas guy, so all the all the roads are four lanes. So, four yeah. lanes, and then they're stacking on top of each other, and we're doing you know loop de loops in the sky. Right. 
your chapters are are broken up by Luther's A Mighty Fortress, which is, you know, one of my favorites. One of the latter edits, I decided to take these these uh, lines and uh, put them onto chapters as well as I could. Are you there? Oh no. Yeah, I I try. Are you there? Are you? Yes, sir. Oh, Remy, listen. Are you okay? We yeah. uh, listen. We are losing you. Okay. But let's do this. Hush, hush is coming out. Well, I don't know how soon. Yes, sir. Do you have dates on that? I don't either. It's it, it's not. It, I was told uh, October informally. Right. Um, wow. but it's not on the. It's not, it's on, not on, yeah. on the upcoming. So. It's. So, I didn't. I didn't get it I'm, for uh, marketing stuff. So I assume it's going to be early next year. Um. That's okay. You guys can make me a liar. It's all right. <laughs> but. Stray's coming out on audio. Uh, let's see. You are working on a podcast right now that will be uh, having to do with Stray's astronomy. No. Yeah, I, I, it's. Uh, I wanted to do a a uh, uh, kind of a reader's companion to the book, uh, where I get to talk about some of my favorite things, like Martin Luther and and uh, a mighty fortress and the, the uh, constellations. Uh, because people continue to ask me about what's going on with this, why is this here, and uh, and clearly I like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> it's a it's so stand around talking to a bunch of people all day. So that's I, right. I, I thought it would be fun to to have this um, recorded. So uh, you're gonna keep me in the loop on that. The minute that that goes up and live, uh, we'll put that on the Cannonball Facebook page. So find cool. us there everybody to keep up with remy remy you're on facebook and twitter and on instagram is there anything any place that you want to send people in particular to keep up with you and your updates oh my they don't need to keep up with me but if they want yeah i'm i'm at i don't tweet as much anymore um but uh i'll I'll mess around on instagram and and post fun things uh as as they strike me i can confirm i've seen them myself (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much, Remy. I really do appreciate you taking the time. And at school, no less. Yeah, it was fun. Yes, sir. Let's do it again with Hush Hush. Hey, I'll take care. Appreciate you. See you, man. Yes, sir. All right, bye. Bye.